Hello. Oh, good to be with you guys. Happy uh, whatever day it is for you. It's Monday here, uh, December 15th. No, November 15th. November 15th. Oh, I almost put us a week Shut away up. from Christmas. Jeez. Wow. So uh, good to be with you. We're talking about baptism today. We're uh, reviewing the Christian faith and, and the basics we need to know about it. Uh, we're kind of turning the corner. Um, the first three parts of Luther's small catechism, which we've been using as a kind of a crib sheet for going through the basics of the faith, goes through Ten Commandments, Apostles' Creed, and the Lord's Prayer, kind of lays a foundation. And now we get to the second half of the catechism, the last three parts, baptism, uh, uh, absolution, confession, absolution, office of the keys is the fifth part, and then sixth part, the Lord's Supper. These three kind of get into how is this faith come to us, right. and how are we sustained in this faith uh, that God gives us. So we'll we'll uh, be looking at these uh, that those three topics the next three weeks, uh, starting right now with baptism. So. So let's get right into it. Baptism, uh, something we're, we're very familiar with. It's the washing of water with the Word. Um, and uh, Ephesians 5 is, is a great passage that talks about uh, the uh, roles of men and women, kind of the duties to one another that we have to, uh, to uh, submit to one another out of love for Christ and to give ourselves up for one another. And then it talks about how the, the relationship between a husband and a wife is a picture of Christ's relationship to his bride, the church. And how Christ has sanctified her, washed her through the washing of water with the word. And, and that's a great clear passage that points to Christ being the one who does it. Mm. And for me, if you, if you stop the video right now, if you don't get anything else, know that Jesus, God, is the one who does baptism. He is the actor in baptism. That's a foundational reality for a biblical understanding of baptism. And that biblical understanding of baptism sets us apart from a lot of Christian traditions that that make baptism into man's work, right? Yeah. No, it's. Uh, I also I always kind of look at it this way when we have. It's really a two part question in the sense that what has Christ done to win our salvation? But then how once we have there, He did that salvation. How do we receive it? Absolutely. Yep. And we start with baptism. Nope. That that's great. And and um one of the terms that is is often thrown around in the the Lutheran Church is it should be understood by all Christians though is what are the means of grace and that goes very well along with that because where is our forgiveness one christ on the cross yeah christ yeah. on the cross so forgiveness for the entire world is one in that place and uh one of the technical theological terms is that's called the objective justification mm -hmm. where christ objectively um literally did something for all of the world by taking on the sins of the whole world dying for those sins and and being punished for those sins that, that death of Christ wins the forgiveness of sins. Now, how does that forgiveness of sins come to us? It comes to us through the means of grace. And, and so we are subjected to that justification hmm. through the means of grace. And, and I think that's a great understanding for us to have, to recognize, because one of the attacks that um, some Christians will make against our, our biblical understanding of baptism is that we are um, taking the works into our own hands and saving ourselves. Such as, so, so the um, misunderstanding is, is people will say, well, you're saying that you're forgiven because of baptism, or you're forgiven because of the Lord's Supper, or you're forgiven because that man wearing the strange collar has said you're forgiven. And, and really, no, we're, that, those are the delivery means by which God has given us these, right. this forgiveness. And, and sometimes when I come across Christians who have that understanding, I'll talk about the fact that we all agree God is the one who gives the faith. Yeah. Well, how does he give it? And that's where the that's where sometimes the uh, the differences lie. Right. Yep. So yeah. so good good thing to understand the means of grace. And so what are the means of grace? These are the means by which grace comes to us, and, and they're all attached to the Word of God. So we have the Word of God, uh, which includes the forgiveness of sins, the absolution. As we um, we'll get into that next time we're together. But uh, a baptism is is a place where that forgiveness of sins is delivered. It's a method, a means by which that grace comes to us, and the Lord's Supper as well. And and notice, uh, baptism has the Word of God with it. It's got the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the Word of God attached to that act. And then the Lord's Supper, the words of Jesus, where he tells us, this is my body, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. So it's those actions, those those means are not outside of the Word of God, but it is the right. Word of God working. Right. So, and the Holy Spirit attached always with the Word of God, going back a couple of sessions ago when we talked about the work of the Holy Spirit. So so that's the means of grace. That's a, a good term to understand. And the other term, before we get into talking directly about baptism, is this word sacrament. Mm. Sacrament is uh, not a biblical word. It's a sacred act, right? Yeah. yeah. 
you could say. Yeah, that's a nice... I know uh, that there's other ways you can say it, too. But yeah, I, I think the uh, Latin is the word mystery, right? Is That's the other way, yeah. yeah. That's yep, and um, so there's there's lots of tradition where this, this word came from, but it's held by the church. Um, a lot of the church holds to this word as describing these things which God has given us to do. Right. Um, so the Catholic Church, uh, not to get too into the weeds with this, has seven sacraments, and I don't know if I can enumerate them all. I always miss one or two, but they got baptism. They got the Lord's Supper. They also have penance. They have um, marriage. ordination, marriage, uh, last rites, and, oh gosh, see, I always forget one. Confession absolute? Is it confession absolute? Well, the penance is what they call confession penance, absolution. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. That yeah, I'm, I'm forgetting one, but anyways, there's there's seven of them in the the Catholic Church, and, and we we will hold that uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper are definitely sacraments, uh, and it's it's again this isn't a biblical word, so this isn't like the uh, key difference between the Lutheran Church and the um, Catholic Church, but we we do see some. Um, some signs of the bigger differences that are there. But what we define a sacrament as is it's something that delivers God's promise. Um, it's commanded by God to do, and it, and it is attached, God's promise is attached to a visible element. Um, so those three things make a sacrament. So you can see in, in baptism, the, the promise is forgiveness of sins. Uh, the command is uh, clear in Matthew 28, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the visible element in baptism is, of course, water. Um, so that's there. And um, just to skip ahead a little bit, the Lord's Supper's got the promise. This is the, for the forgiveness of sins. The command is, do this in remembrance of me. I also like to go to Matthew 28 for that command as well, because he says, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded so you. That's, you include that. That's very good. So yeah. that's something that Jesus has commanded us to do. Um, and then the visible element, of course, is the bread and wine, which um, have in, with, and under the, the body and blood of Christ. But that's a couple uh, sessions down the road for us. So, so those sacraments are there. Now, how many sacraments does the Lutheran Church have? <laughs> well, I... I think historically we've always held to two sacraments, but there is some dis discussion that Melanchthon raises within the Augsburg Confession yep. that confession absolution could by itself stand alone as a potentially a third sacrament. Yeah, I personally hold to it as just an extension of baptism, but yep. either way, I, I can see where you could, if someone holds to it as a right. third sacrament, I could see that. Yeah, so I, I always say two or three. <laughs> two or three. <laughs> two and a half. But, uh, but yeah, I like we can see for the the confession and absolution as an extension of baptism. Right. That which we've received in baptism, we're reminded of, is is redelivered to us again in the forgiveness of sins. Um, but but for that, the uh, visible element becomes the person pronouncing the words. Is, yeah. is how I often look right. at it. But so yeah, you can you can say three, you can say two. The Book of Concord, our Lutheran Confessions, actually does say. Um, I think it says we have two sacraments, but then it also says we have three sacraments. Right. So yeah, so, Luther takes two. Melanchthon kind of opens the door for three. Uh, good conversation over coffee. Yep, yep, yeah, yeah no, coffee or, or beer. So, <laughs> all right, so that's, that's sacraments. And, and with that, I, I want to go to uh, Scripture. Uh, we, we haven't done a lot of Bible um, exhaustive reading, but this is a good list here. This isn't a complete list. This is a good list of places where we see in Scripture um, baptism talked about. And, and um, I'm going to include in the, the, sh the show notes here a, a link to a podcast that's very helpful um, from Issues Etc., um, where Brian Wolfmuller, Pastor Wolfmuller from Austin, Texas, talks about what I wish my Lutheran, my law. What I wish my non-Lutheran friends knew about baptism, mm -hmm. and, and this list comes from him, and um, obviously comes from the Bible, but he, he, he goes through this list here, and so I included it. A couple other things I'm talking about today, he, he does a great uh, job explaining better than, than we'll be able to do in our time together. But um, 1 Peter 3, verse 21, this is, this is one that's a, a great, clear statement. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Um, so it's talking about the, the flood and, and, and the verses leading up to this, um, but, it, but it clearly says baptism now saves you. And yeah, with, with my evangelical friends that we've had discussions on baptism, I always love that first Peter passage at the very end. Yeah. I was, I can, for you Euchre fans out there, that was the right power. Yeah. You, you know, that was the one that... Well, it really seals the deal. It seals the deal. Yeah, right. it's, it's, it's such a clear statement, and so I, I led with it. I actually led with... Uh, um, what did I say? Ephesians 5, verse 25 and 26. Yeah, right. And, and that uh, talks about Christ doing the washing of rebirth 
uh, with the word, uh, which is great. Um, Mark 16, 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Um, I love this passage. We'll come back to this concept in a little bit. Baptism and, and belief, uh, salvation, that's that's a clear thing. Um, it's, it's not a... Uh, there's no uh, mincing of the words. It's not whoever believes is saved. It's whoever believes and is baptized is saved. Um, Acts 2 verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. And what does baptism do? This is a very clear statement. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, I mean, when you're looking at baptism and you see this verse, it's a very clear statement. It forgives your sins. It gives you the Holy Spirit. So mm. it's, a, it's a great thing. Uh, Acts 22, verse 16. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on his name. Two things we can take from that. Lots of things we take from that. But two clear things. Um, it washes away our sins, but it's also done in the name of Jesus. Jesus, right. Yep. And, Is uh, there a difference? I know there's been some talk about in the book of Acts that you do it in the name of Jesus, but then you have Jesus' great commission in Matthew yeah. 28. So the words that we say when we baptize, yeah. In the name yeah. of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but Acts says in the name of Jesus. Yeah, and, and so actually this is, I was planning to get to that a little bit later, but we can take it on right now. So um, say you, you grew up in a church or, or come from a church uh, where they have baptism in the name of Jesus. I baptize you in the name of Jesus. Um, mm. if, if that church believes Jesus is a part of the Trinity, and they confess the Trinitarian understanding of God, as Christians do, um, then that baptism is, is valid, is how we look at it. Um, and so we don't require a rebaptism in those instances. But if um, you were in a, a church that had a, um, say, a, a, a low understanding of Christology, of who Christ is and his part in the Godhead, and they baptized you in Jesus' name, um, we would say, well, we want to make sure that this faith that's confessed, that name that you're baptized in is confessed in that right. baptism. So, yeah, good question there. And that's a great verse to talk about that name. Titus 3 verse 5 um, says, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of rene regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Uh, so washings there, this is not our work again. It's, right. it's Jesus done. Jesus work done for us. Um, Galatians 3 verse 27 says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Uh, I love that picture of robing yourself in Christ's righteousness. That's, that's what's done in, in baptism. Um, the old filthy garments of sin are, are taken from us yes. and, and we have the perfection of Christ given to us. Romans 6, verse 3 through 5, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried with him, therefore, buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. A very clear picture of what's going on in baptism. Again, the work of Christ accomplished it on the cross. Baptism joins us to that work. You notice the common thread, and you got one more verse to go, and it'll say the same thing, but it's, you have the same thing repeated over and over. You have, you have the Holy Spirit. You have regeneration, the forgiveness of sins, a resurrection language. Yep. That You can't resurrect yourself, can you? No, no well, not who lately. Who can do that, God? No, no. Yep. So, I mean, you can just see yep. how God is acting is the actor in these verses. Excuse me. Yeah, and uh, John chapter 3 is a great passage as well. We're not even there yet, uh, where uh, Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus, and they talk about the, um, the regeneration that the Holy Spirit gives. Right. Yeah. So, Colossians 2 verse 12, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So again, a parallel, a close, uh, close rewording, if you will, of Romans chapter 6 there. Right. Yeah, especially that powerful working of God. Yeah. It's very plain. It's, it's clear yes. who, who is doing the work in baptism. And again, that's that's key to understanding um, baptism according to scriptures as, as it's given to us, is that it is God who is doing the work there, which is a lot better than baptism, which um, the way other um, faith traditions talk about it, a lot of other faith traditions talk about it, is, is to say baptism is an outward response or an outward working yes. of an inward action. They actually look at it as an act of obedience. Right. Yep. Not as a sacrament of God doing something, but in re like you said, in response to 
making a decision for Jesus. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, who should be baptized? Well, there's some groups who will say just those who have an age of accountability, and sometimes that age of accountability is represented by the age of 12 or 14. Yeah. And it's when you start sinning, right? When you start sinning, right? <laughs> or you're accountable yep. for your sins. Yep. Uh, yeah. Uh, but the Scripture says something much different. Yes. The Scripture says something uh, a little uh, more inclusive. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So um, we, 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 the, the place you go to for this most clearly is... Uh, um, Matthew 28, where it says, Go therefore make disciples of all, all nations. nations. And so all nations includes everybody. It doesn't exclude based on race or location or age or even intellectual ability. It's, it's an all-encompassing all gift that we give. When we get to the uh, Lord's Supper, we'll probably talk a little bit more about this. But when we baptize, we're, we're not... Um, I don't know if there's probably a better way to say this. We're not held to the same standard as the Lord's Supper, where we want to understand what's going yes. on there. Um, and so we, we baptize babies knowing that they can't understand what's happening. They, they can't um, verbalize their agreement with what God has promised in baptism. Um, but but yeah, it's, yeah. it's a command given to us to do for all nations. In our dogmatics courses at, at the seminary, it, we talked about, well, even in, in Peeper himself, as Doug Manning talks about that hearing the word of God through the preaching of the word of God and baptism initiates grace. Yeah. The Lord Supper is not something that's initiated. Yeah. No, that's a great preserves, way to think yeah. about it. Yeah. Continues yeah. that faith and continues providing right. that, that gift of forgiveness sins and the faith that comes uh, with it. So, um, so who should be baptized? Everybody. And, and so we, we do baptize um, infants in our church. And, and that's this uh, next slide here. Why do we baptize babies? And we already said, um, go therefore and make disciples yeah. of all nations. And, and babies are part of all nations. <laughs> so babies right. are people too, is like a, a, I like to say. So, um, and, and babies are, are people too. The other uh, part of that is, is babies die. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if, if babies didn't die, if, if people didn't die until the age of intellectual assent, which we don't agree with that, but if there was such a thing, then the wages of sin and death is death would not apply until sin exactly. becomes part of your right. existence. So, so the fact that there's death on the scene for, for those who may not be able to um, agree or, or confess with their mouths or, or, or believe with their minds, you know, that, that, um, that, that shows that there is something that God needs to do for these mm. people baby people. Um, and then John 3, verse 5 and 6, I, I want to, um, I pulled this from, from Kaler, um, but the uh, verse here, I, I want to pull it up because I don't want to butcher it completely or, or reject it. So um, he, he, uh, Jesus says, unless a man be born again of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God, but that which is born of flesh is flesh. Um, so so babies must be born again. And, and this kind of dovetails nicely with right. what we were just saying about their need for deliverance right. from you sin, from which the, brings death. Yeah, you quote it from the King James, it says, if a man, Yeah, but in the Greek, it's anyone. Yeah, right. Yeah. It, it's what it actually what it means. Yep. Yeah, yeah. so, that, which is important. And then uh, Matthew 18, verse 6, uh, the argument is made that, well, well, children can't have faith. They can't believe, but uh, but Jesus says, and then again, from the King James, Whoso, whoso shall offend one of these little ones who believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone be hanged around his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. And, and Jesus talking about the little ones, the word there is for right. infants. And so he's talking about infants having faith there. Um, yeah, Luke testifies that it's, yep. it's in the parallel account to that. Yep. Well, yeah. so, so why babies? There's, there's plenty of scriptural support. You can see accounts in Acts where this is for your children and the entire household's right. being baptized. Yeah, that's uh, exactly. We, we never see an exclusivity to baptism. Paul mentions it twice with what well, you have the count of Lydia in Acts 16 mm -hmm. and 1 Corinthians there where Paul talks about he baptized the household of right. Stephanus. Yep. And then he uses it in 1 Corinthians 10 about all were baptized unto Moses. Right. Now he's going to use that my evangelical friends if there's an age accountability and it, did the babies get around a different way? Through yeah. the Red Sea, maybe? I, no, know. yeah, they, they tossed them across Could the water. Tossed them across, <laughs> yeah. no, no, I don't know. And there, there's a, a helpful dichotomy here. Um, again, this came from the podcast. I'll share in the, the notes uh, with this. But um, there, I think there's a misunderstanding about what faith is. And, and all faith 
is received. It's a gift from God. Um, we, we believe in Jesus because the Holy Spirit has worked on our hearts to give us faith to believe. That's receptive faith. Now, there is a reality that at some point in your life, you're, you're able to reflect on this faith that you're given, right. reflect on the words of God, and agree with that which you've already received. And, and so we do have that. I think um, a lot of times, just to be um, kind of gracious about it, I think our evangelical brothers and sisters who might have a different view on baptizing babies, they'll live only in the reflective faith part of things. And, and they might use the word accepting faith or, or faith yeah. that is accepted. But, but I think a, a better word is to, to be able to reflect on that. And so they'll wait until somebody can reflect on their faith or, as they say, accept Jesus into their hearts before baptism, which again becomes an outward expression or act of obedience Ooh. of that which God's done for them. What are some of the dangers of having a solely a reflective yeah, no, I, I think that it's a it's a huge danger because it, it puts the ball into your court. It, it puts the the work of that God has promised and and described Him as the one doing. Um, it puts that into to man's court and says, "I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll agree, and it's up to me." And and when anything is up to us, there's always an element of doubt, and there's oftentimes, if not every time, an element of of despair or failure. Um, in that which we've done, hmm. and you start to question, did I did I mean it, or did I fully understand it, or or did I do it the right way? But when we say, nope, God's the one who does it, it really takes that onus of responsibility off of us, and we can just say, thank you. And we're not denying there is a reflective faith. Right. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's and confirmation, which is, um, I think that's the other sacrament. Seventh sacrament. Yeah. Yeah. Right yeah confirmation. So confirmation. Um, when we do it in our our church body. Um, the uh, confirmation is that reflective faith uh, bearing fruit. And, and I always call, all right, no, don't always, but I often talk about confirmation as being a stewardship of your baptism. So that, mm. that course you go through of confirmation and then that actual act of standing before the congregation and confirming your faith, that's the reflective faith. That's your, you're saying, I've, I've thought about these things, I understand these things more, I will continue to to think about these things and understand these things better. Um, that's the reflective faith that God gives to us. Right. Yep. All right, so next uh, thought here is, is how many times should we be baptized? We've already touched on this um, in talking about baptism in the name of Jesus or in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If, if God forbid, somebody leaves the Lutheran Church and they go and they be become a member of a Baptist church, they will be encouraged to be baptized again. Yes. And and that's, yep. that's sometimes a, a shock when people come... Lord have mercy, thank you. Uh, from a Baptist church to a Lutheran church, we, we don't require a rebaptism because we understand God is the one who does the work, and baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is an effective baptism. We're, we're not, God's not sitting there checking the, the cards to see which um, tradition of faith uh, a, a believer is from when they're being baptized, or an individual is from when they're being baptized, but he's, he's there ready to give his gifts. And this is where that receptive reflective faith comes in as well with how many times i have a friend i have an evangelical friend of mine who gave up on the faith because he was on his fourth baptism because he lived in a re he dwelled in a reflective understanding of faith and yeah. he kept getting baptized over and over yeah because it wasn't he had that doubt he had that doubt it wasn't yeah. good enough the first or the last time he did right or or had those moments where he wandered off the yeah. path and wanted to right. come back and restart and yeah, there's often that um, that picture of, okay, now you can have this new beginning. But the reality is, and this, this is skipped to the end already, this is my, my final note for baptism. Baptism is something that continues working for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we see the, whether it's a baby in the white gown or the, the person standing before uh, the congregation being baptized, we, we see that event of baptism where the water is applied, the word is spoken, but baptism continues as a daily washing of rebirth and renewal. That Even as a white pole is placed over a casket. Yeah, yeah, it's a beautiful picture. The I've mentioned this a number of times. I, I love the uh, connection between baptism and between the uh, uh, commendation of the dying. Um, when we um, we do we do and say a lot of things in both of those settings that that remind us of that continuity of the gifts of baptism. Mm -hmm whether it's the uh, making the sign of the cross on the forehead and on the heart, whether it's laying the hand on the, the head of the, the baby being baptized or the person on their deathbed um, while you pray the Lord's Prayer, those, those things and, and some of the verses are the same. Um, those beauty to realize that this is a gift that endures through, through your whole life. 
So yeah, how many times, and, and this is one of the questions, so if somebody's been baptized more than once, <laughs> what do you, are they a sinner? I, I think that's one of the things where you just thank the Lord for the gift he gave in that first time, and um, you could see a, an, an additional baptism, not as something we should do, but as an opportunity to um, to reflect on that which God gives. What if somebody's what if somebody doesn't know if they were baptized as yeah. a child and they're adult? They heard some things they might have been, yep. but don't know. Do you think someone should get baptized at that point or rebaptized? Yeah, that that that's a good question. And that um, I didn't throw anything in here to talk about sponsors, but that's why we um, enlist sponsors, or they're sometimes called sure. godparents or witnesses, or witnesses yeah. and that's a big part of baptism is because we want people to be able to attest to what's happened there. So a baptismal certificate is a great gift to receive from a congregation at baptism and to, to take care of because you, you know based on that which has been attested to that baptism has happened for you. Yeah. So if there's ever any doubt where someone's like, hey, I don't have, I can't find my baptism certificate and nobody who is supposedly there remembers if I was, you know, that, then we will we'll baptize again and we'll, because we, we want to make sure we're doing this thing that God has told us to do and not doubting that it's been done. So yeah, how many times that's, that's a good question to consider and it, it talks about in understanding it reflects again on who is the one who does the baptism. God does it. He only needs to do it once. He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't halfway baptize you or, or baptize you into, um, it's not like when Jesus healed the man and he was able to see things that looked like Part trees. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't a partial thing. It's complete. So what does it do? This is the uh, important, um, this is where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. Why? We've talked about a lot about what baptism is and, and how we do it, uh, when we do it, who we do it for. But what baptism actually does for us is it works forgiveness of sins, rescues us from sin, death, and the devil, um, and, and delivers us um, the, the status of, of heirs of God. We're, we literally have God's name put upon us in baptism. Um, and I love the, uh, the movie Toy Story for a number of reasons, but for theological reasons, there's a great scene where uh, um, Woody, who's uh, the old toy of Andy, the, mm -hmm. the, the character there, he's, he's feeling down and out, and Buzz Lightyear's this new toy that's amazing, and everybody loves Buzz, and, and Woody's feeling like he, he's got nothing, but, but um, his friends point out to him, or he, he notices, I can't remember exactly how it unfolds, but he notices Andy is written on his boot. Right. On the bottom of his foot, his, it says Andy, and he's like, oh yeah, I do belong to Andy. Yeah. And, and that's what baptism is for us. It's God claiming us as his, him giving us a new identity. It's Jesus' identity. That's that robing, uh, the clothing language that's there. So when God looks at us, he doesn't see the mistakes we've made. He sees Jesus. He sees perfection. Mm -hmm. He sees his child. He sees us as his, that he's claimed as his own. Yeah. I always thought, too, what, it, what baptism does is I think of it as, uh, we talked about it earlier, with Christ's passive and active obedience. Mm -hmm. and, and where his passive act, his passive obedience, we receive the forgiveness of sins, life, eternal life, and salvation. But with his active obedience, we receive his righteousness. Yeah. That's that clothing that clothe yourself. You've been baptized into Christ. You clothe yourself. Clothe, clothe yourself with Christ. Right. So you have that. You have His perfection. Yep. As well. Absolutely. Great stuff. So, so it's it's the treasures of heaven delivered to us. We we started talking about this at the beginning, but it's good to go back to it. Christ did everything on the cross, and baptism gives us everything. Everything. Right. Yep. Yeah. So. So that's, that's what's going on there. Um, can you be saved without baptism? This is a question that often comes up, and it's worth considering. Uh, the thief on the cross is always right. the uh, case study um, for this, because Jesus, uh, hanging on the cross, speaks to the, the thief um, and says, Today you will be with me in paradise. And um, I always wonder, had baptism been instituted at that point? Um, that's a, a yeah. question we... talk. About. There's a reference to the disciples baptizing. But uh, anyways, um, so... Regardless of how helpful that scene is or not, can you be saved without baptism? Yes, but anybody who is saved will be baptized yes. if they can. Yeah, there's a uh, there's a quote that you hear a lot amongst Lutheran theologians. They'll talk about not the absence of baptism that damns, it's the right. despising of it. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's that's a great way to think about it. And the Mark sixteen sixteen passage is a great for that. Um, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. 
whoever does not believe will be condemned. It, it doesn't say whoever believes and is not baptized will be condemned. It, it says um, believe and be baptized, you're saved. If, if you don't believe, you're going to be condemned. Right. So yeah, if so, deathbed conversion, somebody, they're, they're ministered to and hear the gospel and they're dying moments and they don't have an opportunity to be baptized, that person is saved. That 11th exactly. hour conversion right. is, is a good case study. Again, the thief on the cross is, is why that example comes up because there wasn't an opportunity to be baptized. So we don't have to doubt for that. The other time this conversation comes up is um, the death of an unborn child. Mm -hmm. Um, whether it's a miscarriage or you know, whatever trauma happens uh, for an unborn baby, can they be saved? Um, they haven't um, been baptized because they haven't been um, delivered yet. Um, and, and that's where we, we throw ourselves on the mercies of God, and we know that God is good and loving and gracious, and, and He desires all men to be saved. Um, I often, not too often, fortunately, but at times I've comforted parents with the reality that a baby growing in the womb can hear. Can hear, right. <laughs> and, and that John faith comes by hearing. Yeah. yeah, John the Baptist is a great point and case for that. So, so yeah, we can, we can lean into the promises of God and say, this is up to you, God, and we know that you're gracious and merciful, um, all loving. So, all right, let's see what else we got here. Um, how to do it. So it takes water, and it yeah. takes the name of Jesus. Is it special water we got to use? Jordan water, maybe? Good or? question, yeah. yeah. No, this isn't holy water. Okay. Um, we, we, we're we different than the Catholics in that we don't bless water and set it aside for the special purposes. It's just plain water combined with the Word of God. Mm. Um, so, yeah, we, we don't have holy water. Um, and, in fact, I often encourage people to uh, remember your baptism whenever you're washing your hands, whenever you're taking a shower, whenever you're uh, swimming, enjoying uh, the, the, the ocean or the lake. Remember what happens with this water and the Word. Um, so it takes water and it takes that Word. Um, Do you have to be immersed? No, no, you don't you have to. Yeah, good to know. <laughs> Yeah, and that's that is a, a, a I won't say hotly debated, but that's a, a debate that's had among Christians. Some, some, uh, and it's often the the um, faith traditions that hold to a, an obedience baptism yes. that will. Um, well, you, but so do the uh, Greek Orthodox. They'll hold to immersion only as well. Yeah, just kind of. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I've seen some pictures of that little babies yeah, being right. immersed, and um, which is an interesting combination. Immersion baptism with an infant is. A little more uh, practical. <laughs> I like our position. We accept all of them. Yep. It's it's water and it's, it's water the word of God. Word and it, whether it's yeah. sprinkled, poured, or yeah. immersed. Yeah, I've, and I've I've often uh, assented or agreed. Yeah, if we could do immersion baptism, it's got some great symbolic yes. um, um, realities going on. You know, because we talk about drowning with baptism, and when you're under the water, I mean, that's how drowning happens. When you're sprinkled with water, it's really hard to drown. Right. Um, so there's, Especially if you're an adult and you want to be baptized, I can see where somebody will want to be immersed Yeah, to get, I guess, the full experience. Right. Of it the yeah, so I've, I've never done an yeah. immersion baptism myself, but I, if somebody really wanted to, we would probably talk about the whys and the whats, and I might agree to do it. Um, I, my... my um, um, Preference, though, is that it's always done in a church service whenever possible so that the witnesses are there and that people can see the gifts that are given and they can attest to the gifts that are given. One of the things that we uh, that I've personally done in, in the baptismal rites as uh, in the Lutheran service book, it, it, it um, question is, how are you named? And it's very specific. It's how are you named? And then the parents speak for the child. And then the questions go on to say, do you... Um, Ash, I should have brought it up so I had the actual words. Do you, um, do you deny the devil is basically the question. And then the answer is yes. And um, do you believe in the, the Apostles' Creed? And, and the answer is yes. And, and since an infant can't talk, I've, I've gotten in the practice of just before this begins, I tell the congregation and the sponsors and the parents that are there, I say, we will answer on behalf of this child um, because this child's not able to speak for themselves yet, but they will be raised in this faith and these answers will become their answers mm -hmm. as they're taught this right. faith. Um, so it's not, um, a, it's, it's not a, an individual act. This is the community that we're being baptized into, and, and, which is a really cool picture of doing baptism in a church service. So I, I say all that just to say, if we if somebody really wanted a baptism outside or in a 
in an immersion setting. I was setting. thinking, would you go to the Maumee and do it, <laughs> yeah, Maumee River? That's, that's no. a muddy river. <laughs> but no, that that's a great thing to, to talk about, the, the whys of baptism and what benefits are you getting from having an immersion, what benefits are you losing by doing it outside of the church, and so all of that's um, worth talking about. So, so that's a little bit about how to do it. One other thing is... Um, there is, um, in the catechism, in the, I think it's in the back pages, it says uh, emergency form, short form of baptism for emergency mm-hmm. situations. And baptism is different than the Lord's Supper. As you said, uh, um, baptism enters us into the family of God where the Lord's Supper sustains that which is right. given um, through the word of God, um, continues to give the forgiveness of sins. Is another place where we get the forgiveness of sins. But baptism is is something that we, we perceive to be pretty necessary and uh so so in in a case of an emergency where there's not a pastor or an ordained pastor present um a baptism can be done by a, a believer and and that's something that has happened at times yeah and, um sometimes parents when a child's born prematurely or in those situations they'll, they'll do a baptism yeah a lot of times after those emergency baptism they'll We'll go to the church and have it recognized. Right. Yep. There's a there's a rite in our hymnal that that talks about you know and, and the congregation again reflecting on the importance of the community that you're right. brought into through baptism. Uh, we'll acknowledge that baptism and, and rejoice in it. Cool. All right. So when is baptism completed? So this is uh, my keyword here for me. It's my mm. trigger. This is our last slide. So. Uh, uh, baptism is completed, um, and, and it might seem like a silly question because, well, yeah, you know, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, baptism is done. We've already talked about, though, how baptism is something that continues. And, and uh, um, I've heard of uh, funerals referred to, and I've referred to them myself because I like the picture that a funeral service is a baptismal completion. Hmm. You, you ever heard that? No, I never heard that. I don't know where I first heard that, but I, I, it's it's... It's beautiful, and as a pastor, I, I get joy out of knowing this person has made it through the wilderness of life, and the Lord has delivered them to the promised land. The gifts given in baptism have sustained them to the place where um, baptism is not needed anymore. Not needed. The gifts of baptism are, are fully realized. I, I, here's a paradox. I would say that the, I agree with you. The gifts are not needed, but the, yet they still get to have them. Yeah, right. Yeah, they're not needed because the they're, they're in nothing. the presence of the, the presence idea. of God, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, so baptism is something that works through your whole life. And um, as the, the small catechism talks about baptism, it's got four parts. You know, what is baptism? Um, how does water do such great things? And, um, and the, the fourth, this is the fourth part of baptism, that it's a, drowning, a daily drowning of the old Adam so that the new man might iner- emerge. And so I'd encourage you, um, if you don't already, remember your baptism daily. Um, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, invocating the name of God, calling on the name of God in that word, in that name, uh, remember that which has been done for you in baptism, and it's continuing to work for you. So, all right, well, we've said a lot, and uh, there's a lot more that can be said. Um, if you've got any questions about this, or um, next week we'll be talking about confession and absolution in the office of the keys, Ooh. which really gets into... Um, um, the pastoral office, yeah. yep. it gets into um, confessing. Uh, what what sins do we confess and what happens in that? Uh, so that'll be next week. If you got questions about that, throw them our way. Um, but um, with that, we'll, we'll leave you. Very good. All right. Let's go with the Lord's blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit, be and abide with us always. Amen. Amen.